The serious looking man in blue dungarees and peaked cap leaning over the side of the engine and watching the passengers he has brought to their destination from many distant places is usually over middle age. He has had long experience and has worked his way up to the position of an express train driver from the time when he started work on the railway as a youth. At the age of 16 he began work at an engine shed, cleaning engines as they arrived at the shed after the day's work. In this way he learned about the many different mechanical parts of the engine and their purposes. He learned how to wash out the boiler with running water and how to light the fire and raise steam in the boiler. He also became acquainted with the various gauges and levers on the footplate or driving platform. After three years or so he became a fireman on an engine, beginning on a yard shunting engine and gradually working his way up until he became a fireman on an express passenger train. During all this time he had been learning, under the supervision of his driver, how to keep the fire properly trimmed and fed with fuel and the boiler with water. And in his spare time, between these duties, he learned the road over which he travelled. To learn the road, he had not only to become conversant with the signals and to know where to find them, but also to learn the gradients of the line so that the boiler should always have enough steam to meet the requirements of the engine when beating heavily uphill and not too much steam when running easily downhill or approaching the end of the day's work. As a fireman, he also had to learn the rules and regulations laid down by the railway company for the safe working of the traffic, and the duties enginemen must carry out during emergencies such as breakdowns. The time came when he was ready for promotion to the position of driver, and after passing an eyesight test, an engineman must never be colour blind, and an examination by his superintendent and inspector on his knowledge of the rules and regulations and his experience of other technical matters, he was made a fully fledged driver, qualified to be in charge of a locomotive engine. He did not start right away driving a heavy main line engine, but on a yard shunting engine of which he was now in supreme charge. With more experience gained, he was promoted to slow freight trains, express freight trains and slow passenger trains until eventually he reached the position of an express passenger train driver. The large engines of today can run long distances without stopping or being reconditioned and the driver has to have a complete knowledge of far-flung portions of the line, such as between London and Carlisle, 300 miles, London and Holyhead, 264 miles, London and Liverpool, 200 miles, and London and Manchester, 183 miles. He must be prepared to work his train through all weathers, including fog and snowstorms, at any time of the day or night, and he knows his way along the line as well as the ordinary person knows the street he lives in. That is to say, to know where to find every caution and stop signal, and the location of each station, signal box and gradient, both by day and night. He knows in even the worst of weathers, where curves involving a slackening of speed are situated. He must be prepared to deal with any emergencies which may occur on the journey, such as a heated axle or a mechanical failure, and must see that his fireman fulfils his duties with fire and water, so that his engine can haul the train from station to station in the scheduled timings throughout the journey. A driver's working hours are normally eight per day, but he is seldom called upon to drive his engine during the whole of that time. For example, his day may consist of a run from London to Crewe in just under three hours, and after a wait of two hours he may return to London in the same running time. Engine men, as a rule, live near their work, 
for apart from those who work a regular roster of crack express trains, their hours are inclined to be irregular. They have to come on duty at any time of the day or night. A man may start his day's work at 2.30am to work a night express from Scotland leaving crew for London at 3.30am. There are also special trains and ordinary trains which may be working in two or more portions if the traffic is heavy and which need engine men at short notice. Most engine sheds have knockers up. Young lads who go round on bicycles and knock up the engine men at their homes and tell them what time they are required to come on duty. In his left hand, the driver is carrying his tin box containing his train notices and information on all work on the line over which he has to run, as well as his food and generally a bottle of tea which can be warmed up on the engine. His right hand carries his hand lamp, trimmed and polished, ready if required at any time during an emergency. He may have to leave the engine in a tunnel, or at night time walk to a signal box. If an accident has occurred, his fireman may have to run forward with the hand lamp showing red and try to stop any train that may be coming in the opposite direction. On reaching the engine shed, the driver books on at the office. Here he learns of any special news that has come through relating to the line over which he has to work, or he may receive an emergency notice of a diversion from his ordinary route because of damage done to the line by storms. His fireman books on at the same time. The driver and fireman then go to find out from the arrangements board what engine has been allotted to them. A driver and fireman seldom get the same engine to work every day, for a locomotive travels a far greater distance than a driver in one day. An engine may leave Euston on an express and run right through to Glasgow, but the driver and fireman are relieved at Crewe or Carlisle fresh men coming on to take the engine forward. After finding his engine number, the driver goes with his fireman to the stores. The driver collects his cans of oil and other stores necessary for the day's work, while the fireman takes out a shovel and a set of tools for use in case of emergency. In the meantime, a gang of cleaners has gone thoroughly over the engine, attending particularly to the working parts. They are seen at work in the foreground of the picture. The engines have been placed in position previously so that they can move off to their various trains in correct order without unnecessary shunting. It can be realised that a heavy engine weighing up to 150 tonnes and hauling a train of perhaps 400 tonnes must be in perfect working condition as a breakdown on the line not only affects the passengers in the train concerned, but delays numbers of trains behind. Each locomotive is therefore gone over carefully by a shed examiner, who sees that all the working parts are in order and everything is safe for the next day's work. The picture shows the examiner testing the steel tyre on one of the driving wheels with a hammer. If the tyre is loose or has a crack, it is at once revealed by the sound resulting from the blow. In such an event, the wheels must be changed. A very big job with an engine, and luckily one which is very rare. Before the driver arrives, the steam raiser has lighted the fire by means of a number of fire lighters placed on a shovel and fed into the firebox. The pressure of steam slowly rises in the boiler and the needle on the top gauge in this picture moves upward. The needle is seen to be very near the full working pressure of 225 pounds to the square inch. When the needle passes this point, the pressure opens the safety valves on the top of the boiler and releases the surplus steam. The engine by itself can be moved at a very much lower pressure from 80 to 100 pounds. 
any repairs have already been carried out by the shed fitters and the locomotive is now ready for its day's work. The driver and fireman are seen approaching it. The driver and fireman climb up onto the footplate and put away their tools, stores and food boxes in the steel cupboards provided for the purpose on the tender. The fireman then goes off to one of the sand bins where sand is dried over a furnace and collects a supply for the sand boxes on the engine. The drawing power of an engine is governed by the friction of the driving wheels against the rails. When the rails are dry, the friction is very considerable, but if they are damp after a shower of rain, they become slippery, and the driver will have great difficulty in starting a heavy train, his driving wheels often slipping round without moving forward. In order to avoid this, a pipe delivers dry sand onto the rail just in advance of the driving wheels, and as soon as the wheels meet it, the extra friction enables them to adhere to the rails without slipping. Here the fireman is seen on the frame of the engine pouring the dry sand he has collected into the sandbox by means of a filler. In the meantime, the driver also examines the working parts of the engine, giving particular attention to all oiling points so as to ensure that all oil boxes are filled and working properly. A bearing which gets overheated for lack of oil may cause a serious delay, if not damage to the engine. The driver is responsible for keeping the moving parts and bearings well oiled during the time he is in charge. Here is a diagram showing the most important control levers and gauges on a modern locomotive. Vacuum gauge tells the amount of vacuum created in the brake pipes throughout the engine and train. It must be maintained at 21 inches when running and if it falls below this the brakes are automatically applied to the wheels. Regulator this lever controls the flow of steam from the boiler to the cylinders which drive the engine. Vacuum brake handle Used by the driver for applying the brakes on engine and train. It allows air into the pipes, thus destroying the vacuum and applying the brakes. Reversing lever For reversing the engine. Steam pressure gauge for showing the pressure of the steam in the boiler. Water gauge, a small glass tube which shows the level of the water in the boiler. There are two of them in case one breaks. Carriage warming gauge, shows the pressure of the steam put through the steam heating pipes of the train. Fire hole door. Two sliding doors opened by a handle when the fireman wants to stoke the fire. Having moved off the shed, the driver approaches the station and is signalled to back on to his train a few minutes before it is due to start. Even this is a skilled job, to bring a moving object weighing 150 tonnes gently onto a train in which passengers are moving about without a severe bump requires careful handling of the brake. As soon as the train and engine buffers meet, the fireman couples up, hooking the screw coupling on the tender over the drawbar hook on the front carriage of the train. He then tightens the coupling by means of the screws so that the buffers between train and tender are held tightly together. Next he couples together the continuous vacuum brake pipes the pipe on the tender near his cap and the one on the train nearest his right hand. Lastly, he couples up the steam pipes for heating the train in winter time, the one on the tender below the coupling hook and the one on the train seen behind the vacuum brake pipe. When this work is completed, the driver draws the air out of the brake pipes throughout the train by means of a steam jet on his engine called the ejector 
and in so doing eases the brakes off each carriage as well as the engine. When the guard in the rear van finds the brake gauge there showing 21 inches of vacuum, he tests the brake by opening a valve and letting in the air from his end, promptly applying the brakes throughout the train. Then he watches until the vacuum has again been recreated up to 21 inches by the driver. Previously, the guard has added up the total tonnage of the train, each vehicle has the weight shown on it, and given this to the driver. On receiving the hand signal from the guard, a green flag by day and a lamp showing green by night, the driver looks to see that the starting signal is at the all clear and opens the regulator and applies sand to the rails if necessary, the train moves off on its journey. This shows the view the driver gets from inside the footplate. He sees the end of the handrail along the firebox and boiler on the right hand side and an express about to pass on the next line. During the journey, the driver keeps a constant lookout, not only for the semaphore signals, but for any other emergency hand signals he may receive from men working on the line. Also, it may be that he in turn has to whistle a warning to some trespassers or plate layers who have not heard the approach of his train. Meantime, the fireman is fully occupied, feeding fuel into the fire and water into the boiler, both of which serve the all-important function of keeping up the steam pressure. He attends to the steam heating of the train and assists in spotting signals sooner observed from the right-hand side of the footplate. Block System of Working Trains before the electric telegraph was invented, the only method of working trains over the same line of rails was by the time interval system. A railway was divided into sections, as it is today, each section guarded by a man provided with flags and later with fixed signals, and no train was allowed to enter a section until 15 minutes had elapsed after the previous train had entered it. Obviously, there were grave drawbacks to this method of working, for apart from the small number of trains that could travel along the line per hour, there was no guarantee that a train had reached the other end of a section before the next train entered it. In case the previous train had broken down in the section, drivers had to travel very cautiously round all curves and through tunnels looking for smoke or steam during the daytime and for a red tail lamp on the back of a train at night. With the installation of the electric telegraph, the block system was introduced and is in force today. This enabled a definite space interval instead of a time interval to be preserved between each train on the same line and no train was allowed to enter a section of a line until the previous train had passed out of it at the other end or was suitably protected by signals between it and the following train. In the diagram the signals in section C are raised, all clear to allow the first train to go on to section D, which is unoccupied. The signals in section B are horizontal, danger, to stop the second train from entering section C while it is occupied. When the first train has passed the signal box at the beginning of section D, the signals in section B will be set to all clear to allow the second train to proceed to section C. Distant signal. When semaphore signals took the place of flags, these were placed near the cabin in which the flagman was stationed and the slow speed of the trains enabled drivers to come to a stand before reaching them when they were set to danger. 
As the speed of trains increased, it became necessary to give drivers of trains not only a warning that they were approaching a stop signal, but also an indication whether that stop signal was at danger or all clear position. The distant or caution signal was therefore introduced, fixed sufficiently far back from the stop signal to enable the heaviest and fastest train to be brought to a standstill at the latter. The arm of the distant signal has a swallow tail end to it, is painted yellow and at night has an orange light when at caution and a green light when at all clear position. The distance signal is not a stop signal, but merely indicates to the driver the position of the stop signal ahead. Before it can be put to the all clear position by the signalman, the stop signal ahead has first to be placed at the all clear position. When, therefore, a driver finds the distant signal at the all clear, he knows the stop signal at the signal cabin ahead is also in the all clear position and can maintain speed into the next section of line. Home or stop signal. As previously stated the stop signal, usually called the home signal, is placed near the signal cabin so that if necessary the signalman can communicate verbally with the driver or guard. It will be noticed that all stop signals are painted red and have a square end to the arm. They show a red light when at danger and a green light when at all clear. The normal position is the danger or horizontal position. When the arm is sloping at an angle of 45 degrees downwards or upwards it is at the all clear position. There is no difference in these two positions, they mean the same, the upward slope having superseded the downward owing to modern signal practice. In short sections it is often necessary to place the distant signal for the next stop signal underneath the previous stop signal as shown in the picture. Here the driver, who is seen proceeding at speed, is given the information that he can pass into the next section but must be prepared to come to a stand at the next stop signal beyond because the lower or distant signal arm is at the caution position. Modern signalling practice on main lines is replacing semaphore signals by powerful light signals which can readily be seen by day as well as by night. Do note, reference has only been made to the most important mainline running signals. There are others, of course, such as starting signals, shunting signals, yard signals, etc. not touched upon here. Here is what appears to be a complicated gantry of signals likely to make the driver scratch his head. But in reality, if one knows the line, they are quite easy to read. The white signal arms on the right hand side of the posts are read only by trains coming from the other side of the gantry. The signals on the left of the gantry refer to the line underneath them on the extreme left going straight ahead. The next two sets of signals refer to the line coming into the picture at the bottom right hand corner and passing under them. The first two read for the straight ahead direction and the slightly raised pair for the junction off to the right. You will notice the point arm set for that direction and the top arm at the all clear. The next two signals refer to the line on the extreme right of the picture leading round the curve to the right. It will be noticed that the signals are as nearly as possible over the lines to which they refer. And now the train is approaching the end of the journey. 
the passengers are getting their luggage off the racks and putting on their hats and coats. The fireman has stopped making up the fire and is allowing it to burn down so as to leave just enough steam to get the engine into the shed and finish its day's work. The driver is looking to see which platform has been indicated for him to run into. A minute later he will bring his 150 ton engine and 400 ton train gently to a stand within one foot of the buffer stops. As soon as the train has been unloaded and drawn out from the platform the engine goes into the shed but the duties of the two men in charge are not yet over. First they have to take the engine onto the turntable and turn it so that it faces in the right direction for the return journey. Here the engine is seen on the turntable. It is being turned by an apparatus attached to the turntable worked by vacuum from the engine. The next move is to take the engine to the water column where the tender is filled with water. The fireman puts the bag into the tank and the driver turns the wheel controlling the water valve. It takes only a few minutes to fill the 3000 gallon tender. The engine is then moved to the coaling plant. This consists of a high hopper into which the coal is placed in bulk. This picture shows a complete wagon of coal being lifted from the rail level until it reaches the top where the whole wagon is tipped over so that the contents fall into the huge tank. The tender is placed under a chute. The door is opened and the tender is filled with a definite tonnage of coal. Notice the stream of water falling onto the coal as it emerges from the chute in order to keep down dust. When the tender is filled, the coal is carefully trimmed to prevent pieces from falling off the tender when the engine is running. The engine now goes onto the pit, a sunken alleyway between the two rails. The fireman goes into the pit under the engine and rakes out the ashes from the ash pan with a long metal rake. The pits are lighted and have a grid in the bottom through which the ashes fall onto a conveyor belt which takes them up to a railway wagon for disposal. The wheels of the engine are seen resting on the rails on each side of the top of the picture. Notice the shadow of a driving wheel on the right hand wall of the pit and the pipe sprinkling water onto the ashes. The steam pressure by this time is very low, too low for the engine to move itself any further, so another engine is attached and places it in the correct position ready for its next day's work. The driver and fireman then gather their oil cans, tools, lamps and shovel which they replace in the stores. The driver then makes out a no repair ticket if everything is satisfactory. But if anything has gone wrong during the journey he makes out a repair sheet setting out exactly what is defective as it must be put right before the engine again leaves the depot. When the driver has attended to his engine and booked off, he looks after himself at the canteen before going to the railway company's hostel for the night.